Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the February 10 work session of the Ann Arbor City Council with respect to the fiscal year 21 budget overview, financial administrative services, police, fire, community services, and city administration. Mr. Lazarus, you have the floor. Thank you, and good evening, Mayor Taylor, council members, uh, staff who are here, as well as members of the public. I want to um, thank all of you for your assistance in the budget process so far and for your input that will be coming over the months between now and when council adopts the final budget. Um, we all hope to deliver a budget that meets the needs of our community and ensures a financially sound approach. Um, so this evening's presentation gives you an overview of the general fund and the related budget considerations for the coming year. Uh, the agenda for this evening is an overview that I'll provide. Uh, we'll go into some projections that Mr. Crawford will address. And then each service area will, that is primarily resourced through the general fund, we'll talk about the council priorities that we established in the December planning session, look at some measures of success and key performance indicators, and then talk about some of the impacts uh, and non-financial adjustments for FY21. Uh, some of the key dates that are upcoming are shown on the slide. Uh, you'll note that we do lose a date on March 9th because of the presidential primary. Uh, so that does create a little bit less opportunity to discuss some of the topics that are in the various funds that you'll consider. Uh, again, tonight we'll talk about those units that get the majority of their or significant portion of their funding from the general fund. Uh, those are shown on the chart. Um, the two remaining general fund agencies, the city attorney and the Office of Sustainability and Innovations, will present their budgets on February 24th and March 30th. And significantly, the sustainability budget will be provided in conjunction with the presentation of the carbon neutrality plan. Um, as it's shown on the uh, schedule as well, city administrator's budget is presented, recommended budget is presented to council on April 20th and per the city charter, council considers and adopts the budget this second meeting in May. Some notes on the general fund and there is a lot of information on one chart. Uh, the general fund pays for the general operations of the city government. Revenues to the general fund primarily come from property taxes more than 50 percent. Uh, it is important and significant that the city's operating millage has decreased by four and a half percent over the last five years while the total revenues have increased and that is indicative of both increases in property values and the amount of new construction. Public safety entities constitute the majority of general fund expenditures at over 40 percent and the general fund proposal for this year continues the allocations prioritized in last year's budget, and you can see those listed at under the fourth bullet. Um, as we transition into the unit by unit analysis, I do want to pause and reflect on our move to a priority based budgeting and decision making process as it's depicted um, on the feedback model shown on this slide. The box on the left is the priority matrix which council reviewed as exercise one in the December planning uh, session. The matrix draws in all of our governing documents, community surveys, council priorities, and staff recommendations, and leads to the definitions of our programs and projects, which you see in the second box. The level of services to be provided are guided by a definition of what success looks like through the development of key performance indicators, which in turn then determines the resource to be, uh, thought to be needed to achieve that outcome. The items that are shown in yellow are the things that we'll touch on this evening. Uh, to the far right, you see a white box that says reports, dashboards for results. Those are things that we continue to work on and while council has been provided with an annual report for FY19 and a first quarter FY20 update, our goal is always to make this viewable by the public online in a highly transparent manner. Uh, this, I don't, this is the uh, revised priority matrix. You've seen it before. I put it in here really for reference, so I won't dwell on it. 
As you remember, exercise two, exercise one was updating the priority matrix. Exercise two was responding to some challenges. And we used a color code of uh, green, yellow, and red to show uh, the priorities. So those on the top are, mm -hmm. are in green, and those were the ones that council indicated were both high, um, high urgency and high importance. The ones in the yellow generally were of high importance but not as urgent, and the ones in red were viewed to be lower in urgency and importance. And that is not to say they're not important. It was just in a relative ranking. Those are the ones that were viewed as less pressing. Um, the column on the right on this table shows where you'll find these in the budget. So that's the uh, service unit where you'll be able to find where those uh, challenges and priorities are listed. So I am going to turn the microphone over to Mr. Crawford to take you through the next couple of charts. Uh, good evening. So for a budget discussion, I want to just take a minute to ground you in what the financial projections look like so you know what resources you have available as we go into these discussions. The chart in front of you has a large box. On the first column represents the fiscal 21 initial plan. This is when we approved the two-year budget last year. That column is the plan of what we had projected 21 to be. The next column over economics reflects as we uh, our estimates this year for all the things that have happened from an economic standpoint. These are not changes driven by staff. These are just pure economics. Um, what you'll see is on the recurring uh, uh, surplus slash deficit, the plan was adopted with a $200,000 surplus. As we roll through economics, there's now a $500,000 surplus that you can use on a recurring basis to address um, issues and uh, initiatives that you'd like. However, in, in fiscal 22, I do want to point out that that is projected to be minus 1.6. So uh, as you make decisions, it's important to remember the context in which uh, the longer term projections look. And this projection in 22 is what we have seen in the past. It's within the normal range of what we see as what happens when our revenues don't increase as fast as, as uh, inflation does for our expenditures. On the one-time items, I do want to draw your attention to the fact that this includes the, the million-dollar uh, distribution the state is giving us for fire protection grants. If By including that without any expenditures against it, you'll see that our uh, undesignated fund balance would be at about 17.6% at the end of 21. For your frame of reference, as you start to mull decisions, for every million dollars in expenditures that you make, that's roughly a $900,000, or I'm sorry, a 0.9% reduction in um, f the fund balance number, okay? One million is about 0.9. Let's see. Going to the next slide then, I want to take just a minute to give you an overview before we jump into the departmental level discussions. So on this slide, the, the second column in called recurring pulls from the prior slide, and, but, but what it does on the second row is you'll see that some of the impacts that staff's going to bring you today actually come with their own revenue. They're really zero impact to the city net. And so what this column does is you'll see $272,000 of additional revenues included, which means in the first section there, uh, the bolded line that says funding available for staff requests you see 772, that's the 272 on top of the 500 I talked about on the last page. <clears throat> Below that in that bottom section is a summary of the staff, staff request broken into some categories. So basically you've got $772,000 of monies available to spend. Staff requests total at the bottom $2.3 million. Those are some of the prioritization, the trade-offs that, you, that you're going to need to make. Some of the requests are, um, were included, uh, well, let's see, we didn't have any on the recurring included in the base plan. You'll see the 272 in expenditures there. Those are the offset by revenues up top. So if you do not spend the 272 in expenditures, or you do spend the 272 in expenditures, you also get the revenue with zero impact. And then there are the other categories there. We've got some in, impacts that relate to um, uh, the required services that, that, that we have meeting the policy directions that you've established. We've got uh, looking at your high priority commitments. We've got some impacts as well as 
some impacts we've categorized as if we end up with extra money at the end of the year for whatever reason, you may consider funding those out of fund balance. And then there's some items that, that would likely not be funded. In the one-time column, uh, we've got about a million three or a million two forty-seven available for uh, one-time use. Uh, and then going down that column, similar category, they're the same category as you can see. Those, those requests from staff are 3.5 million. So as you can see, there, there are a lot more requests, about three times the requests as there are resources available. That's the big picture going into this discussion. I want to st start off uh, the part, any questions on that before I jump to departmental? Okay. Yes. Um, you, you've got a, uh, a workbook or an ex, uh, a workbook we've provided you where we've taken a stab at putting them in buckets, mm -hmm. and uh, those are the ones that are really kind of the um, at this point prioritized the least. And and that workbook is really for you guys to consider, give us feedback on whether you would agree to that. It's really kind of for discussion purposes. Just thanks. Yeah, the question about the 1.3 in one time revenues for fiscal year 21. Um, can you explain what that is? Is it state revenue sharing? And uh, if so, can you remind us how that's you know handled and what Governor Whitmer put in her budget? So one million it represents the fire protection grant monies, and the two forty seven. You may recall that uh, as the uh, constitutional statute constitutional okay. revenue sharing increases each year on top of the one million. Yes. Oh, on, so, okay. so on top the two forty seven is really the portion of, of revenue sharing that is now considered non-recurring or one time. That is derived from our policy that we use. Is that, that the statutory piece or the yes, constitutional or whatever? It's statutory. OK. Mm -hmm. Thank you. OK. I'll jump into the departmental impacts by talking about non-departmental, because that's the one that's kind of the oddball. Non-departmental is the place that we put um, expenditures. Uh, it's primarily debt service and pass through to other entities. But we have a few items that we put in there that could relate to, uh, that are not specifically defined for a known, known um, action up front. And let me just kind of go through those. So the overhire program, oh, thank you. <laughs> the overhire program we've had for a number of years. We had planned to um, not have that uh, recurring in 21. This is an impact requesting that we do it for another year. It is a, another, it's a one-time request. Uh, some of our uh, secession planning plans have, uh, are still in process. And so there's a request to extend that for another year for $100,000. When you think about the second line for the fire station master planning, this is setting aside a half million dollars of that million dollars for um, fire usage. And the recommendation here is really to start planning for the construction of or activities related to the fire station master plan. So what we would do with this case is if this were funded, we would transfer this to the capital projects fund and start building up that fund balance so that we can uh, pay for the construction of, of what, what is decided. Uh, the third line, U of M dinner, um, every couple of years, uh, the, the senior, the governing bodies of the University of Michigan and, and the city, along with some senior staff, gather together to um, uh, t talk about issues and, and, and things. And the city has not done that in several years. This is uh, on as an impact to do that in fiscal 21. Um, we host some years, they host other years. The next line down is um, uh, an impact suggesting uh, a uh, supplemental $500,000 contribution to the pension system. You, as you recall, your uh, funding policy for the pension system goes up at about 2% per year. Um, in order to help address and mitigate impacts and make pro more progress on the funding level of that plan, which you'll hear more about in a later presentation, there's a suggestion here to start making an incremental impact above that so that we can reset that base higher. You may re recall me saying that the last couple of years that uh, resetting the contribution level, level higher before we let that 2% continue would be beneficial, in my view. The next line is uh, uh, the capital sinking fund. You may recall that all the general fund assets that we have to replace 
um, buildings and, and things like that and, and renovations and um, ongoing uh, capital issues. Um, we need about $400,000 per year. During the budget adoption last year, $92,000 was used for another purpose. We'd like to restore that. So that is a recurring item, and you can see that um, on, on the right with the R. And then lastly, um, uh, what we are, haven't really finalized the name, but considering an imp implementing an internal carbon tax. This is an interesting idea that you're going to hear more about when you hear about from the sustainability people and uh, department in, I think it's April. But I did want to, as we go through the presentation now and in the public works, the idea is uh, here is to investigate and potentially implement an internal tax about where we generate carbon. The purpose of that would be to um, uh, uh, fund um, uh, climate action initiatives which reduce our carbon footprints. This would be a mechanism for us to um, self-fund internally. At a small dollar amount, relatively small dollar amount, uh, this would be a $30,000 impact on the general fund. You'll, you'll see the impacts on the other funds as they come through in, in future presentations. And, 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 and a more uh, broader description of what, what we're thinking there. Mr. Lazarus? Mr. Mayor, oh, before we proceed, can I, I just make a point? Um, I had originally intended to call, uh, to seek uh, a closed session at the end of this meeting to discuss the uh, police chief matter. And um, because we've been advised that there would be significant restrictions on what we could discuss in that, um, I won't be calling for that closed session. And we have some news outlets here, I think, who are waiting to see if we take any action on that. So I just, I wanted to say that I'm not gonna call for a closed session. And, um, and if that <coughs> um, so you don't waste your time. releases the news media from <coughs> having to sit through our entire presentation, maybe maybe that helps them. Fair enough. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you for that. Um, so we'll begin the unit by unit expiration with the city administrator's office. Uh, the units within the city administrator's office are shown on the organization chart. And again, remember that the Office of Sustainability and Innovations will present its budget on March 30th, along with the carbon neutrality plan. Um, for those who want to go back and look historically at the um, city administrator's office, also note that Fleet and Facilities has moved in, has been moved in under the assistant city administrator, and that accounts for a large amount of any budget increase that you may look at from past budget documents. Uh, these are the priorities that council identified for the city administrator's office, and they are, again, green and in amber to show their relative ranking uh, based on, on the feedback that we got from council in December. Each of the um, presenters this evening will start with a chart similar to this one, and it identifies the programs uh, with the organizational elements. One of the things you'll see as we go through the process of performance-based budgeting and decision-making is we'll define what those programs are. The second box in shows the amount of budget that's allocated to each one. Here, the largest amount of uh, funding within the seat administrator's office is, when the, is in HR. That's not for labor. That is for all the costs that come along with HR. Uh, the boxes to the right of that uh, show the priorities again, the high priorities. So under the clerk's office, you see increased voter participation. Under human resources, the two items were to increase workforce diversity and to implement non-union career progressions. Then towards the bottom, under sustainability and innovations, the two are to improve the energy efficiencies of our buildings and to address carbon neutrality. Some of the measures of success that come with these, uh, increasing Voter participation, uh, we should be able to track the increase in voter turnout and absentee ballots over previous years. For workforce uh, diversity, we should report back on the outreach methods that we use to expand the recruiting base and then track and report on the demographic profile of our applicants and new hires. For the non-union career progression, we should develop and finalize the success strategies program documents this coming year. Uh, and, and then the last two, implement improving energy efficiency of buildings and addressing carbon, addressing carbon neutrality are items that will be presented on March 30th. 
So some of the impacts to achieve these priorities are shown. Again, on the right, the type O is a one-time, R is, re is recurring. So as we go down the list, you can see, um, starting with increasing voter participation, there is a cost to create a satellite office to improve registration. And then there are costs for new equipment that the clerk will have to purchase in order to help speed up the um, counting of ballots. Then there's also temporary staffing for that satellite office. Under increasing workforce diversity, the two items there are startup funds for our diversity, equity, inclusion work, and then continuing to fund the Job Corps program that we started this past year. Our goal there is to transition that to third party funding as well as we look for um, grants and private sector money. Implementing the non union career progression, there's a small course cost to cover our training, and then there is the thought of adding a development supervisor. Um, that would be a recurring cost. And remember, these costs are all unconstrained at this point, and with your help, we'll be able to prioritize them. Improving the energy efficiency of the buildings is about a $100,000 cost, and then finally, uh, with the carbon neutrality, we'll address that with the OSI budget. Some other impacts that are in the city administrator's office that weren't tied to council priorities. Uh, there is, there are some small costs up front related to HR. Uh, there's one staff member we're proposing to put from three days a week to four days a week. Under fleet facilities and aviation, there's the duct cleaning, which would be tied to the previous project to improve the HVAC. A couple other things that have come up, uh, doing a structural analysis and building analysis for 926 Mary Street, which the city clerk will remind us is the oldest polling place in the city, as well as other uses. The, um, a2 municipal complex, the pavers in the back need to be uh, replaced. We talked about the uh, HVAC modernization. Additional fleet management staff, we've received one request to add an FTE, and finally some temporary staff as well for fleet facilities and aviation. Some other horizon issues, these are things you most likely will not see in next year's budget, but lay out there uh, just beyond the planning period. FY23 is the end of the warranty period for the new voting equipment. Uh, because of the nature of the equipment that county, the county purchased, uh, the cost to extend the warranty for years 6 through 10 is $65,000 a year. That's currently not part of our budgeting thought. Communications will continue to monitor the franchise free stru fee structure at the federal level in the event that it impacts revenues. And finally, as we look at HR, there's a continued turnover st of staff as significant numbers of staff enter the retirement window. So those are things we'll continue to watch in the coming years as well. So I'd like to pause and see if you have any questions. <laughs> if not, I will turn this over. Mr. Hanner? Oh, I'm Mr. sorry. Hanner? Thanks. When I saw that the, uh, so the, um, the city clerk's office is 2.8% uh, of that budget and communications 4.8%. Of your total budget. So um, is that, I'm just curious, is the communications, does that include CTN and all that, operations of CTN, the network? That's just the general fund impact. So that's um, staff. I think it does include the CTN budget. I just wondered if the clerks, it seems like the clerk does so much that is it because some of their services are fee for service or it's, it's hard to believe it's less than communications. City, the city clerk stat is, is per salary and then the funding for, which is funding for support of the elections and the normal clerk's um, operations. We'll check on um, communications. I believe that's only, um, I think that does include CTM, but we'll check. Oh, yeah, I just wonder what was in that number. Thank you. Thank you. Um, page 15 and page 16 uh, pertains to voting. Um, we, uh, we look at a significant cost for a high-speed tabulator for um, absentee ballots. Um, seems like a significant cost, and I appreciate the information now. Um, and then we talk about new equipment after um, fiscal year 23. I think it's in the next slide. Um, would that new equipment satisfy some of the... Uh, uh, tabulation speeds that we we want to address the tabulator and separate um, 
Ms. Beaudry can jump in. Really, we expect a pretty big increase in absentee ballots with no reason absentee voting, mm -hmm. or ab if that's correct. We're, the 65,000 is not for new equipment. It's hmm. because the equipment we have is reaching its warranty expiration, and it's to continue um, the maintenance. Okay. So the, it's, it's the 65,000 in your, the horizon issue is for just contract to, services right, to, maintain. to maintain the equipment we have. Right. So with the $50,000 for this um, tabulator, how many absentee ballots are we, is it for, obviously for all elections, I'm just, it's a pretty significant cost just to get an answer an hour sooner or six hours sooner. It seems a very expensive premium. We're still looking at what our other options are because we're actually finding that the high-speed unit is probably going to come in substantially higher than, than what we were asking. Um, we have regular tabulators, so we're, we're reviewing all the options, and it might be that we could add additional regular tabulators at a reduced cost. But we're um, last presidential election, we were at 15,000 absentee ballots, and we expect that we could possibly um, reach 25 or 30,000 this year. The, um, the equipment that we have, the new equipment was purchased um, through a grant, so we didn't pay for the initial procurement of that. So, but unfortunately, because it was expensive equipment, when it comes out of warranty, that's our burden to carry forward. Well, I'm, I'm glad you brought up the grant, because that was another question, whether we, we apply try to use state and federal grants to help pay for these things. But I won't dip, debate this for very much longer. I appreciate the information on it. Mm -hmm. Curious to know about the pavers, too. It seems like those aren't very old. Uh, we're already replacing. Um, and just wondering what, what the issues are with, with that, if I could micromanage for a second. Um, I think the best thing is for us to respond to that as a question from council. I don't have the details on the, um, right. on the project. Yeah. Right. Sounds good. It'll be. I do. I do. Um, going back though to um, to the tabulators, there are some issues, some um, items going before the legislature about letting us starting to count the absentee ballots earlier, which would help with as opposed to after the polls close, and that would help, or, or even same day. So that would help there, as well. Um, certainly, we'll pursue state funding. We're not the only municipality that'll be impacted by equipment coming out from under warranty as well. So knowing that that lays out in the horizon, we can add that to the things we'll look at at the state level. Councilor Nelson, then Lum, and then perhaps we can move along. I have a question about slide 15. I'm, I'm looking at the bullet point under implement non-union career progression. I'd, right. just, I'd, I'd be interested in some more explanation of that, particularly the um, the employee development, the development supervisor, just some explanation of what that is. So the, the first bullet there are some costs to develop some, some training and professional development materials. The second is the fully loaded cost, should we add a development supervisor um, that may not survive the prioritization effort, so we may not add the FTE. But at this point, we are presenting to you all the impacts that staff has identified um, so it's un it's really fiscally unconstrained right now. Well, I guess I guess I'm curious. What is what is implementing non-union career progression? What is that? Um, a couple of years ago, we did a non-union compensation study, and it provided a uh, some recommendations on how people can advance through their careers. Uh, a part of that is developing a professional training and development plan for our non-union staff. We don't have those materials or capabilities right now. And if we don't add an employee, we will have to we'll look and see what the load is on the other HR staff and see how we can re-spread the workload to pay attention to that aspect of development, employee development. So, so there's, um, there are items that ad address technical competencies as well as organizational competencies. And then in order to tie career advancement beyond midpoint in this scale, we would need to be able to track each employee's development history and, and the training that they accomplish as well as the other factors that would contribute to their advancement. So, so we would be hiring somebody to oversee the training and advancement of internally of city employees? That's what the ask is, yes. Okay, thank you. 
When you say ask, you don't mean that that's the proposal. You, you mean that is the. We've provided counsel to all the impact statements that staff has provided without editing them or taking them off of consideration. We're clearly, as Mr. Crawford showed in the previous slide, we're not going to be able to fund all the impacts. So um, I think when you look at where this ranks, it's probably more towards the unfunded requirements right now. Thank you. But so we're not, you know, it's just in looking at, at a prioritized approach to budgeting, we want to get Council's feedback on all the items that we've identified. Councilman Long. Thank you. I appreciate Councilmember uh, Nelson asking about this employment development supervisor FTE um, request. Um, and we just say that, you know, and I appreciate hearing more about what uh, is uh, contemplated in terms of what this individual would do. And obviously, employment development is important, but I will just say it seems to me that, I don't know, the more. It's, that it's more the responsibility of the individual departments, managers and supervisors, not HR. And so I, and, and I also don't know how the staffing levels in, in our HR department compare with comparable cities. So if you can address that uh, tonight or speak to that um, later, uh, these observations about this position and our staffing and whether the plan would be uh, to wait until we have the new HR director before making an, any decisions on, on staffing or hiring in HR. Um, the, and then just in general about FTEs, uh, in looking through the budget impact sheets, uh, it appears that we have budget requests for about 10 new, um, 10 additional FTEs. Is that correct? Sounds about right. Um, so can you uh, remind me how uh, many FTEs we added to the fiscal year 20 budget? And during the year, because I recall, of course, that we, had the, we added a police audit manager and an FTE in the sustainability office. Those were budget amendments. Uh, but I can't remember if we added more beyond those two. Again, if you, if, as a follow-up, that would be helpful. And then I will have more questions later on the subsequent slides, but just um, you know, and thank you for all this information, the work that, that went into it. Um, but just a comment on the general fund revenue. Um, and the comment is that it looks like fiscal year 21 uh, will be another year of healthy revenue, which is obviously a very good thing. Um, but the slide, slide number four, where we reference, um, there's a, there's a bullet there where we reference the general operating millage and we say that it's falling because the, um, it's falling over the last five years because uh, the millage is fallen. I, that, that's just really misleading. And um, I mean, folks seeing that would conclude the city revenues have declined uh, when in fact the opposite is true. And revenue growth has been very robust and uh, it's, it's increased about 10, 15% uh, over that period. So. Obviously, it's not a huge deal, but uh, I just think we should be more careful about what we put in some of these slides, because I think anyone's takeaway from that would be, um, yeah, saying that the millage has fallen the last five years, that, oops, the uh, revenue must be falling. And again, it's technically correct, but I do think it could be misleading for folks. Thanks. Thank you. So CTN is in the budget. Thank you. So I'd like to um, turn this back over to Mr. Crawford to go through financial and administrative services. As we do that, I just want to make sure that I understand exactly when we see proposed budget uh, impacts. It, it, fundamentally, it's, it is not your intention as administrator at all to present these the, these these set of services and these set of expenditures. Uh, in the administrator's budget. We are being presented with a set of options which exceed what you think reasonable for us to select. Your request of us is essentially to go through these options and make selections, identify priorities right. that you will reflect in the budget. So under no conceivable circumstance will all the budget impacts be in the administrator's budget. Is that correct? That's correct. Thank we you. we had sent out a, uh, a spreadsheet that listed all of the impacts broken down in these categories. 
and attached also were the staff descriptions of what those impacts were. And when you, um, you see the categories underneath the blue bar in the middle of this table, um, we're carrying over $500,000 plus from last year of one-time non-recurring impacts that are, that are in the budget. As uh, Mr. Crawford said, there are some impacts that come with associated revenues, and those are primarily related to Housing Commission and then the uh, Fire Protection Grant and some other staff changes that, and those, if you don't, again, as Tom said, they are kind of net zero if the cost and the revenue offset each other, but to show you the true impact of the general fund budget, they're included. Uh, then there are some core services that are required to meet policy direction where council has told us to do some things. And if those are not included in the budget, then we'll need some change in the policy direction that we got from council to not include them. Uh, after that, council's um, gone through their priority uh, exercises and those high priority commitments are what are shown on that next line down. Uh, as Mr. Crawford also said, there are some impacts and they are, they are generally um, uh, one, one t they're, they're mostly one time, but if there are things that we see at the end of the year that we have an increase in the fund balance, we can come back to council and ask to include those. Uh, we may see them all before the council's adopted. It may require, for the budgets adopted by council, it may require a budget amendment to bring them back in to fund them. Uh, and that is a uh, balancing between how much will be in the uh, unrestricted fund balance and how much do you want to put forward for those priorities. And then at the, the very bottom are some impacts that on the spreadsheet you'll see that at this point it, they're, just, they're just not high, prior enough to, high priority enough to even compete against the other requirements. So on the spreadsheet that you have, what we're asking is for you to rank order those and see if you agree with the first cut we've taken at them. But again, the bold line above the blue line on the chart shows how much is available for us to balance the budget without dipping in the fund balance. Thank you. Just. Oh, can I just follow on to that? Uh, yeah, hey, Council Merlo. Thanks. Yeah, I just, no, and just to follow on to that, that thought, I just, you know, so, yeah, I mean, the staff requests are huge. It's 5.8 million. We obviously can't afford all that. Um, so we were given this impact prioritization exercise. And um, so we have important decisions to make on priorities. And I appreciate the opportunity um, that these work sessions provide for all of us. And uh, to better understand this, you know, the department uh, detail and appreciate the opportunity to weigh in on the on the request with the budget impact prioritization exercise that you you've asked us all to complete and I hope I hope we do do that um, I mean this year's budget normally the second year's routine this one is anything but r routine second year because we've you know a lot's changed since last year we've begun to take real action on affordable housing as part of that we're making decisions on on you know taxpayer owned assets worth up to 50 million um, we've also set a carbon um, neutrality target and we'll learn more about that on March 30th I think that's correct um, so that's going to require significant financial commitment by the city um, and again, as we see from the materials that you gave us tonight, and thank you for all this, the request for funding from the departments uh, far exceeds uh, what we can afford. And again, that's before we get the carbon neutrality action plan. So, um, uh, but I, you know, so it's not a case this year where we're tweaking the plan uh, that was established a year ago. It's, it's really much different, I think. And, um, because of these significant things that have occurred since we adopted the plan last year, these two major significant things. So, thanks. You're welcome. Okay, in the uh, uh, financial and ser uh, administrative services area, there hasn't been an organizational change, so these entities reflect the same that were there before. Um, this next slide shows the priorities from your exercise with the two top ones being uh, de-risking the pension and OPEB plans and increasing small and local business outreach. While the others were listed, they were not as high a priority. 
uh, when we look at where those activities will occur, this is the uh, programmatic um, kind of allocation that Mr. Lazarus was referring to earlier. Um, I'm not going to linger on this, other than I'll get on to the impacts. Um, so uh, how would we measure ourselves for these priorities that were identified? Um, a, a couple suggestions for uh, de-risking the, the, the system. You know, one is we can report back on the status of, of, uh, of the analysis that we've done for, for um, de-risking the plans. Um, we could also measure um, how much of an increase would the city's, uh, if, if we look at uh, risk as measured by uh, how much the city's contributions change, we could look at what the forecasted percentage increase is in the city's contribution if our returns are 1% um, uh, lower than we planned. Uh, and then also uh, for, for small and local business outreach, we, we could uh, develop a metric which uh, reports the, um, uh, how much of our procurement occurs from businesses in town. Those are the top priorities. And improving uh, financial reporting, which is a little bit lower, there are a number of things, a big one we're gonna work on, and what may help inform you as you look for ways that you would like to um, address your top priorities is this priority-based budgeting, and that'll be a, a significant effort that we pursue over the next year, as well as um, some of these metrics you've, you've seen before where we are, uh, try to deliver a report that, that receives the um, industry awards, as well as ensuring we don't have uh, internal control or deficiencies. Um, so as far as financial impacts, um, I mentioned to you in the non-departmental area, this $500,000 for the system, this would help us start ratcheting up and I think make some progress in de-risking. Uh, if we define de-risking as, as um, uh, having less volatility in the city's contributions, um, this would help us achieve that end. Um, and then also uh, as far as uh, their the city's talked with Spark about leading a reverse procurement initiative. And what that basically is, normally when the city does something, we'll issue out the word that uh, this is the service or product that we want. Everybody come bid on it and let us know. A reverse procurement initiative is where we sit down and invite companies in and tell us how they can help solve our problems. That, that, that can be a way that we learn new things that we, we were not aware of that are out there in order to address our problems. Um, I'm going to ask uh, Mr. Shuchuk to come up and talk about um, the financial impacts in IT. From a financial standpoint, for all of the services area um, departments and finance, we don't have any service impacts. All of uh, the impacts in my area are really in IT for this year. Hi, everybody. Um, the IT department has an opportunity to do some restructuring. Um, since I've been here, um, we've been We've been pretty top heavy on senior level folks and we have an opportunity through some retirements both uh, uh, recent ones and older ones to be able to make some changes uh, the strategy is to really instead of hiring so we have a senior level person that's going to be retiring and instead of hiring a senior level person what we want to do is we want to bring in some junior mid-level people so uh, on the slide it reflects uh, the hiring of a, of, of a um, help desk specialist and we will be taking these positions and we'll be slicing them up. And we will be using uh, uh, a help desk position for part of that senior level person's job, another application specialist that's currently on staff. And then that will go ahead and give us an opportunity to hire some other people in some areas that we have a need and they will show up in horizon issues on the next slide. Uh, one is adding an FTE for an infrastructure engineer. And what this will allow us to do is the, to give the infrastructure manager some assistance to focus more on security. So a horizon issue is security. Cybersecurity um, is, is uh, as you know, uh, very, very complex. It keeps um, escalating and we continue to deploy more tools to mitigate it and it's going to just get worse as time goes by. So we want to allow that manager to be able to do that and free up some time and give some of the administrative duties to uh, another uh, mid-level person. And then the last one on there is a an application specialist or a business analyst at a mid-level position. And what that does is that uh, allows the application delivery manager to focus more on the business intelligence tool that we purchased and to uh, help build our data-driven um, data-driven uh, um, uh, city initiative 
which is our business, uh, which is the Yellowfin business intelligence tool that we purchased. And that, again, is going to be another horizon issue uh, moving forward. So the net of this is we will be taking some of the funds from the previous retirements, and it equates to a, um, to us exceeding, uh, to additional expenditures in uh, of $55,000. Uh, to our budget, and we plan on spreading that cost uh, 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 through the IT charge um, uh, to the departments that uh, it affects the most. So, questions? Yes. Um, excuse me. You, you have the retirement of the um, senior level right. um, person as a one time expense. If they didn't retire, you'd be paying that per year, wouldn't you? I, yeah. Well, okay. the new expense or the replacement is the yeah. reoccurring. So, okay. So, it, yeah. yeah. It's right. listed as, as a one time, but okay. it becomes reoccurring in the new uh, positions. Thank you. Yes. Um, I was at one of your talks about smart cities, and so I'm wondering where smart cities fits into this chart. It uh, fits into it um, um, greatly. Um, the business intelligence, the fiber initiative um, uh, that, uh, that we continue to build out throughout the city allows us to connect devices. Mm -hmm. And in order for you to have a smart, in order to have a smart city or do uh, smart initiatives, you have to have a few things. One, you have to have power. One, you have to have connectivity. Uh, the other one is you have to have a management tool, which is an IoT platform that can manage these devices remotely so we don't have to expend manual resources doing so. And the last one is the business intelligence tool that can capture the data and really deliver it back to the business so we can make good business decisions. So our goal is, be, is to become uh, data rich and really use that data to uh, become uh, more operationally efficient and to save money. Um, so it, it all ties in. There's a whole strategy behind it, and I know that we're going to be talking about smart cities in the future, but all of these tools, they really tie into each mm -hmm. other. And if you take one of them out, it really, it, it's problematic in, in achieving what we want to. Uh, and will there be any software uh, costs? Uh, y yes. In, in the next budget? Okay. Oh, well, y well uh, again, um, as we remediate our systems, as we upgrade uh, mm -hmm. our, our infrastructure and the assets that we have out in the field, you know, those costs mm -hmm. will come with those projects and they will snap into the model that we're building. Um, so yeah, there is going to be a cost, but there are going to be cost savings as a result. And those should be um, realized uh, when, you know, before we even go and, and pursue an opportunity. Okay, great. Okay. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Mr. Zuchek. Uh, and I certainly support, you know, finding offsets, and you've done that. Your, you know, it appears the position, again, is funded by the difference in the salary of the retiring person um, and their lower salary replacement. And, um, but I, you know, in general, I think, you know, positions should be justified on the merits of the need, and, and you've been explaining that to us, uh, what the horizon challenges are and where the needs are. So uh, just in terms of... Um, you're speaking to the need for adding the infrastructure engineer mm -hmm. at this point. What ha, what has changed in terms of workload? It, it's the security. It's the security. Yeah, the cybersecurity. We do. Um, we spend a tremendous amount of time on cybersecurity. Uh. Cybersecurity uh, really it it is pervasive to our entire department. It falls mm -hmm. in every area that we do. But we need somebody to focus on security in the city mm. and really focus on it. This will give our infrastructure manager the opportunity to do so. If we do not do that, there are uh, 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 chief information security officers, they call them CISOs, that organizations hire to do mm. that particular task. And they are six-figure, uh, 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 minimum six-figure mm. salaries, and they're extremely hard to find. There's virtually no unemployment in the security realm. Mm. So our strategy is to do our security across our departments, uh, and the alternative is to go hire one of these uh, CISOs to come mm -hmm. in and do that exclusively. Okay, thank you very much. I'm just going to wrap up by uh, touching base on the horizon, the other horizon issues in the service area. Um, in addition to the ones that Mr. Shuchuk mentioned, which are at the bottom, 
Uh, we also, uh, on the financial basis, you know, we've been doing succession planning for some time. Uh, the implementation of that, we're really in the throes of that right now, and that is going to be something that goes through uh, this next year and probably two for sure. Um, the the priority-based budgeting, you know, this is an important tool for you guys and for staff, and, and uh, that's going to take, that's definitely a, a big initiative, as is the uh, de-risking the plan. And then the other thing we'll be doing uh, as we go forward is really working on the business cases and supporting the, their development to make sure that um, uh, whether it's, it's climate or solid waste, that we're having sustainable uh, business models um, put in place. So uh, that is all that we have. Uh, I'm going to, Chief Kennedy is your next uh, candidate for fire. Okay, uh, good evening, uh, Mayor and Council. Uh, thank you for the opportunity tonight. Um, looking at the uh, safety services uh, structure, uh, fire, and then um, uh, DC Forsberg will be after myself going over police. Um, and as you can see, emergency management is tucked under the fire department. Uh, we are not asking um, for the fire for any um, increase of FTEs or organizational uh, impacts with our um, uh, budget for uh, FY21. Uh, going along with the theme uh, shows the, the priorities from uh, Council uh, with the, uh, the greens and then the amber and then the red. Uh, I hope to be able to provide a little bit more background on the, uh, the red one this evening that was uh, previously discussed in December as well with the uh, potential need to uh, upgrade our services to an uh, ambulance transport unit. The uh, breakdown of budget for the uh, fire department, so that 20% going towards um, administration. Um, the focus of that with the acceleration of the fire station replacements, increase in diversity, uh, emergency management, that is just one FTE for us. Uh, fire operations, that is uh, 72 FTEs are assigned to that um, out of our 87 FTE count. So that's the, the bulk of our expenditures. And then for fire prevention, we have um, six personnel assigned there. Um, one um, management assistant, one fire marshal, and four fire inspectors. So the uh, prepare and issue the RFP for architectural services for station four, uh, that is a hope for fiscal 21. Uh, actually, I'm excited to share something with you at the end of the presentation regarding that. Um, part of that is also gonna be to, or part of the fire station master plan will be to relocate fire prevention from uh, its current site at station two to station one, which will free up the crew at station four to relocate there during the construction period. So all part of the, the, the chess game that is going on with the fire station master plan. Uh, in terms of diversity, um, as Mr. Lazarus had pointed to, work on some better outreach methods and work on our demographic, demographic profiles of applicants. Um, in terms of the fire cadet program, that is something we currently have funding for. Uh, we hope to actually have that posted this spring. Been working with uh, HR to identify both a um, position description along with a, a posting description on that. And then uh, for emergency management, it's outlined and we're continuing to refine our fires, fire inspection efficiencies. And in terms of uh, response times, uh, just work on lowering those and meeting the goals outlined in the fire station master plan. Um, as Mr. Crawford had mentioned, uh, the 500,000 that is allocated in this slide, this would be for the actual RFP for architectural, um, for, for the design, to do the design for, uh, actually the build design for station four, and then the 150,000 to renovate the, sta the space that is going to be vacated by Washtenaw County Metro Dispatch when they move from current station one out to a new facility on Z Road and they are expected to be out um, by this time next year. Their, their intention is by the end of 2020 with kind of some flex to be out by this time next year. Uh, from diversity, the, um, uh, that's a recurring expense that is already budgeted for emergency preparedness. Um, again, current expense, that includes not only the payroll, but also all the other uh, adjunct facilities that goes with emergency management. And the, uh, the 12,600, we have a current uh, fire inspection software that's been online for uh, just about 10 months now. Um, that is to uh, help with some scheduling uh, with that for some uh, efficiencies for our staff. 
the other impacts that um, aren't listed as a one time, and this is for the um, implementation of the uh, basic life support transport to replace our current light duty rescue. Um, this has become the busiest unit in the city. We've had it uh, online now for about 18 months, and it went from a non-existent rig to the busiest rig, and so it has uh, more than been proven the merit. We are not asking for any increase of staff with this. Um, in some further metrics that we have been able to continue to maintain since I last was before you in December, over 158 days, there, we have experienced um, 132 delays. The average delay that we are waiting on scene for HV is 16 minutes for those 132 delays. And our on scene time has been 1,804 minutes over the last 158 days. So this delays are, are having some tremendous impact citywide of our staff are on scene with the patient requiring transport and there's a delay of a transport rig. And again, this is not to replace HVA, it is work in partnership with them. So when they go to zero status or they have delays, we have the ability to kind of catch them up and that not only frees up fire resources, but it also frees up um, HVA as well. Uh, the upgrade with, I'm sorry, was there a question? Uh, just a, a clarifying point. So the, the need for the upgrade is a result of our personnel going on site delivering the first round of treatment and waiting for an ambulance from HVA to come take them to the hospital. Yes, sir. And HVA currently, our contract with them doesn't provide enough support because of what? Um, so we, we do not have a contract with them. Um, HVA has a service agreement is probably the best way I could say for the entire county. The, there is not a specific um, advanced life support contract between the city of Ann Arbor and Huron Valley Ambulance. Um, so there, there's not a, a direct contract that we can have. It's, it's based upon at a, at a county level. Um, there's an issue nationwide just with a lack of personnel going into the field of EMS, and that is not unique to HVA, so it is not an indictment on them. It would be any private EMS providers I, dealing with similar issues. Okay. So. so by adding this $83,000 a year, it's... Oh, sorry, so that's the 214. Correct. It's a, it's a one-time purchase to, uh, currently the um, crews respond in basically a modified pickup truck, and so this <laughs> would put them in an ambulance, so when we do have those times, they can transport and we're not keeping crews on scene. Okay, sorry, I was conflating the, those two line items. Is, is Emergent Health Partners, do they? Yes, have Emergent Health. Okay. Yeah, they're the parent, they're the umbrella corporation. Gotcha. Okay. So the, the, the second line deals with our fire dispatch, which Emergent Health Partners also does, and we are looking to um, receive increased service, and obviously if we're gonna look for increased service, um, that's gonna have a price attached to it. Okay, so first line item, buy an ambulance. Yes, sir. Second line item is increased service for dispatching. Correct. What is the current pay point there? Uh, the current dispatch contract? Yeah. It's at 118. Okay, and what, what I guess what is the, what is lacking in our current? Um, we're, we're dealing with uh, service expectations. It's a contract not only with us, but the other uh, 13 fire departments in Washtenaw County. Um, what we're finding is when they are dealing with peak uh, call times is that um, our units are calling dispatch and not getting an answer because the dispatcher's tied up dispatching another fire department or taking additional 911 calls. Um, the other part, that, so that 83,000, we're, we're still in talks with them. That's a projected cost. Um, we would not expect it to exceed that, um, but it would be to add some peak dispatchers along with the fire dispatch supervisor, which they do not currently have. Okay. So. And, I'm sorry. I'll let you ask your question. No, you're fine. Uh, what, um, what's your sense of how, how much is the issue that, that they have a, a broad set of, of local clients with competing needs? versus uh, we, we need to increase our contract size. How much is it, I mean, are we, we really maxing out our current contract as it is now? It's just a unique situation in which they have a lot of clients using the same screeners and dispatchers from the same location. It, it is, and, and it's, it's tough for us to, um, to kind of parse out what the city of Ann Arbor cost is with that. 
Um, we've done a lot of comparables and benchmarking, and um, all of the benchmarking that we've done in Michigan is we, we are very, we are incredibly low in what we should be paying. Okay. Hmm. So I, I don't take that as. Um, just because we found some sweet deal doesn't mean we should spend more. But. Well, no, I understand. I understand. I understand. It's it's we're asking them for an increased level of service, and when looking what other communities are paying for fire dispatch and trying to have parity both for our purposes and theirs, that's why I'm comfortable that that if we're going to ask for increased service, then we should probably be paying market rate, and I would say right now we're not at market rate for fire dispatch services okay. for city our size. Councilor Griswold. Do we have an estimated date for when we might get this transport unit? I know we talked about the need to get something as quickly as possible. Well, this is, this is just a, an impact, um, as Mr. Lazarus said, there's a, we have more requests than we have funding, so it'll be up to council to prioritize. There, oh. There's not current funding for this. There, there is. Year's. No, I, I know that it is next year, but we had a very specific discussion about the risk to the safety of our citizens by not having this and having people uh, laying in the street or wherever like the cyclist was. And so I, it was my intention that we were going to move this up, and even though it was going to be paid for in the next year's budget, because it was like an 18-month delay in getting the unit, I'm just wondering if we've done anything to prepare for if, buying um, it. Yeah, pre-order. Or, or looking to see if there's a used unit that might be available. Yeah, so we have assembled the work group. We have specificate. Okay. So if... If, if the direction from council and, and, the, and the funding is, is directed, we can move immediately on that. We are we're at a position to move waiting. Oh, okay. So direction. it might be helpful for us to pass a resolution? I, I don't want to get in front of the budget process. No. <laughs> but I... Um, no. Sorry. Just a little bit of a chicken and egg argument. Yeah. Right, yeah. right. So if council gives us the direction to do it, then with what funding is available, we can order it and realize that we've made the commitment for next year. Okay, and there is some work, pre-work to do before we would even budget the item. I think Chief was going to state that we developed the specs for it yeah. so that we can go out for bids. So okay. That and part of it's been done. It's yeah. done. Okay, thank you. Councilman Lum. Yeah, okay, so, right, this is a slippery slope. I mean, we can start, you know, pulling things off the budget that... There are people and bodies Council in the street, I, I and we want I to be the, Council prepared. Council Member Griswold, I have the microphone. I Thank you. I mean, I... So, I would like... To, so, we have a budget priority setting exercise that we all need to do and I appreciate the homework that we were given for our budget retreat and and I it's nice to see some of that feedback folded into what you're presenting tonight um, and uh, but budget protocol budget discipline is important and you know on the next slide slide 31 you know so in the in the second ward you know there's a reference to Continuing discussions with the U of M on replacement of fire station number five. Um, and that's listed as a, uh, it's, on, it's a, on the horizon slide. So I just hope that's not an indication of timing. Um, and I will ask you later for an update on those discussions. But, you know, it's just another example of many things. And it's in next year's proposed for next year's budget. But this one's on a horizon issue, which concerns me. Um, but just in general, I think, you know, and, and Mr. Crawford alluded to this earlier, um, the priority-based budgeting um, is an initiative that we adopted in the last year or so, and that's a positive step that we, that we need to continue. Um, and this all gets to, you know, aligning spending with priorities, uh, which I think with taxpayers, priorities and I do think that should be our job one and and as we know uh, the staff requests are significant and we simply don't have the funds to fund everything so I would just 
uh, ask that we stay focused on the task at hand and um, and work within the budget protocol and process and uh, and the discipline that's associated with that. Councilor Griswold. I have budget discipline, but I also feel that the safety of our citizens is paramount, and there are times when we may have to, and I'm not saying we're going to pay for it right now, but we need to be ready and we need to react. And if necessary, I'll bring forward a resolution. I'll talk to staff later. I just want to make sure that when this budget is approved, we are ready to go. Please carry on. Um, okay, I believe I've covered the uh, other, other impacts. So um, horizon issues, um, we've really made some substantial reductions in our fleet over the last two years. Um, so this is for fiscal 23. Um, we have two current reserve units. Um, they both current year are over 15 years old and have 100,000 miles, which for a fire truck is an awful lot of road time. Um, and so those reserve units aren't scheduled for replacement until fiscal 27. Um, I don't have a lot of confidence they're going to last until then. And when we say reserve units, if we have a normal engine or a regular engine go out of service for uh, maintenance, for tires, for DOT inspection, one of these reserves gets activated. Uh, when we have snow events, um, when we have uh, large uh, home games, we'll, we'll activate a reserve unit to add to city capacity. So the, these are, even though they're reserved, they're regularly placed in a frontline service. Um, so we, we do need to depend on these. And so we just want to um, basically uh, reduce the replacement cycle from fiscal 27, which is currently planned, to fiscal 23. Um, We've talked about Station 4. Um, after that, the, the intention would be for Station 3 um, at, at Vets Park using a, a similar plan. And uh, again, long-term horizon would be the, the, the renovation or the replacement of Station 1 downtown across the street. Um, have a picture I'll show in a second. Um, uh, some very initial ballpark estimates to do a renovation of that building would be around $9 million. A total replacement um, would be around 18 million. Um, there's some really interesting models nationally, um, and Washington DC has actually become a national model for this of some private public partnerships, which given the location of that station, the downtown core, um, I, I think we, there's some real opportunity there. Um, and then uh, Council Member Lum, to your point with station five, we are continuing conversations with U of M that, that hasn't uh, fallen off. So. Response times are the worst uh, area. This is an area that's growing significantly. Uh, the U of M uh, student population and campus, it, this area is going to uh, include a third of the student body. Uh, we had the presentation from the U of M folks. Yeah, this, they're growing the North Campus Research uh, um, complex property and uh, North Campus significantly. And so here sits fire station number five, which services that all of that U of M property too. That's growing tremendously. And um, so here it is, it's, a it's on the horizon slide and it doesn't feel like it's a, a priority. And so I will be following up on, you know, to get an update on those discussions and uh, you know, this should be a public-public partnership. And, uh, I mean, U of M, you know, <laughs> write us a check. Yeah. Um, you are serving a lot of U of M property here and students and staff and, uh, and again, in our Ann Arbor community in this area where the response times are the worst is growing by leaps and bounds, so. Agree. Thanks. Yep. Thank you. Okay, so some exciting stuff. I, I just literally received these this morning. So this is for station four. This is a conceptual drawing. Um, so 
it's a little difficult to see in, in this drawing, but the, uh, the, the slope of the roof is a, is a total solar array. Um, the, the plan is for Ann Arbor to really be cutting edge and the hope and the plan would be for this to be the first carbon neutral station in the state of Michigan. So we can really kind of be uh, leading um, from a statewide initiative with the uh, carbon neutrality and, and other sort of city sustainability goals. Um, again, this would be at the current location. Um, tremendous amount, uh, so uh, in addition to solar, geothermal, um, tremendous amount of usage of natural light. Um, and really, I uh, think for most would, that, that station now doesn't really add to the uh, aesthetics of, of that part of town. It's rather, uh, uh, <laughs> there, there, there's not much to it from an architectural perspective. And I think that not only does this, I'm sorry? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, cement, cement block. Um, th th this is uh, not only will be a, a wonderful place for our employees to work out of for at least the next 50 years, it meets our environmental um, uh, aspirations um, and, and is really, I think, a, a, a great showpiece for, um, uh, for that section of, of the city. And, and the, uh, the budget for this is $5 million, so that's where we're at. Um, and then the other part, so this is what DC, so DC is now, they've, they've done three of these stations and this would potentially work for station one downtown across the street. So this station is actually the first two floors or fire station and then it's a squash facility um, above. They have another station that is a, a first two floors is fire station and then it's a Hyatt hotel and they're building a third right now that is going to be apartments with I think two or three floors of that being um, affordable housing. So um, there, there's, uh, Chicago's looking at doing a similar thing, um, but this, and DC, their costs for these have been zero. So that's kind of some, again, sort of a horizon thing for us to potentially look at. Just, just as a, a comment, I just by happenstance happened to be in two separate hotels around the corner from each of these. Oh, okay. I took it upon myself to walk, just walk in. And uh, the firefighters uh, really love the, the new facility, so as a point of reference. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, there, there's some ideas out there, so instead yeah. of us having a nine or so these, eight. So this is a public-private partnership. Yes, like, ma'am. Uh-huh. Yep. So some, it, again, given the. Very creative. The, yeah. the downtown, that, that long-term for station one could be an option. So, okay. I think Thank I've you. taken too much time. Thank you. Good evening. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks for having me. Uh, so I'm going to fly through some of this stuff. What you see on the first slide here is uh, are, are the priorities ranked uh, that, that you all had for us. I think we're one of the only departments that has an asterisk, uh, and that is because uh, some of the programs and activities uh, had fewer than three responses. Uh, so I think if there's one takeaway uh, from this, what you'll see is we're uh, moving forward and asking for some stuff. Uh, I would just draw your attention to our community engagement and, and the amount of money that is currently allocated for that. Uh, and so some of the next few slides, what you're going to be seeing is uh, we would like to, to increase that number a little bit. Uh, so the, the majority of our staff are located in our patrol uh, division and a lot of our, our equipment like fleet are, are up under the administration. So that's why those percentages are high the way they are. All right, so here's, uh, based on those priorities, some of the performance measures for success. Um, if we're, we're hoping to increase uh, the diversity within the department, uh, some of the performance measures for that would be uh, reporting and outreach methods uh, used to expand recruiting uh, base within HR. I think we've had some success with that already when you approved our uh, police cadet positions. Um, as you'll note under the third bullet there, uh, they have uh, completed their training, uh, or they're going to be completing their training uh, with us and are going to hopefully be attending a police academy soon, and we're hoping to replace them. So as uh, some of the impacts to council, to, to you all that, that we're asking for, uh, what you'll see, sort of the theme here is uh, increasing our data-driven abilities uh, and then also our community focus. Uh, and so in the first three bullets there, uh, the reoccurring amounts for our annual training increase. Uh, that's a $60,000 uh, annual 
increase to our current budget. Our current budget for training is about $71,000. 21 or 20,000 of that comes to us from the state. Uh, so if you kind of do the math of a uh, department of 126 sworn police officers, that's a little bit less than $600 per police officers annually that we're investing in their training. So with this $60,000 increase, uh, that would bring it up to right around $1,000 per officer. Not to say that we're going to spend $1,000 per officer uh, if approved, but uh, that would increase that amount. The other number you see below that, the additional training for police officers, that's specifically to uh, account for the police cadet positions. So when we send them to a police academy, we are paying for that training. And currently, the tuition cost is coming out of our overall training budget. Uh, so that $19,000 reoccurring is for uh, sending our cadets to a police academy, as well as uh, police staff and command training that we send all of our, we try to send all of our current supervisors to. Uh, it's in Eastern Michigan University. Uh, the one-time uh, command staff professional development training would be uh, a one-time uh, cost where we would want to uh, train uh, some, have a, some executive level training for our lieutenants and deputy chiefs. Uh, so some of the things that you'll see uh, for the uh, increasing foot patrols and community engagement, uh, that, that is uh, where you'll start seeing some of the full-time, uh, some, some of our FTEs. So the data architect analyst position is sort of the foundation for what we hope to come back to you in, in, the, in the coming years as far as asking for additional FTEs for police officers. Uh, so this position would give us the ability to build the foundation to give the argument on how many additional officers we need, where they should be, and what they should be doing. Uh, this position as, um, is not to take the place of anything that the city's IT department would be doing for us, but this is, uh, as, as we've discussed, probably uh, over the last few months, uh, the ability to uh, create dashboards and integrate our data so that we can give you uh, better reports and, and inform ourselves on what we need to be doing and where we need to be doing it. Uh, that position is, that's what that would be for. So the, that amount, the reoccurring is for that FTE and it's not only the salary but also benefits. Uh, the cost for the community policing events is that as we increase our engagement with the community, we want to be able to host more events than we are currently. Uh, obviously then that costs money. Uh, the public information officer uh, position, so currently it's a shared uh, responsibility of, amongst our staff, so this would give us the ability to better uh, engage with the media as well as craft messages internally within the department and with the city. Uh, so if we were to roll out a uh, special victims unit like we did, we would have a comprehensive communications plan where we could uh, publicize it both internally uh, as well as externally to the department. Uh, we're hoping in the, as the weather warms, uh, we can put more officers uh, out of, get them out of the cars on foot, but also on bicycles. Uh, so that's why you see the $14,000 there for one-time purchase of bicycles, bike racks, and, and protective gear for those officers. We've already started uh, soliciting interest from our officers in uh, becoming part of the bike team. Uh, so we have a really high level of interest so far, so we would like to be able to put them all on bicycles uh, if possible. So these are some of the other impacts uh, that we're, um, that we're, we're seeing uh, this year. Uh, so as you know, we purchased body cams for our officers. Uh, the system that we purchased Axon is different than the current system we use for in-car. Uh, so what you'll see with the uh, Axon in-car camera solution, both a reoccurring and a one-time, would be for the difference in cost. Um, that it would to replace the current L3 cameras that we have in the cars. It's just the end of life for those. So we're going to have to replace them in, uh, with, within the next year or two. Uh, and this would be the sort of the difference in cost with what uh, IT and we have saved to replace them. Um, uh, Kalia is our accreditation uh, ma uh, manager position. So we're accredited through the Commission on Law Enforcement, uh, wrote it down, Commission on Law Enforcement Standards. Uh, and this would be, so currently our lieutenant in charge of professional standards is in charge of compliance with the accreditation and gathering proofs of compliance. Uh, she already has a full-time job, so we're, we're asking for a full-time position here. It would be a non-sworn position, uh, somebody that could manage that process for us. Uh, you'll also see, uh, so currently we don't have any uh, explosives detection canines. Uh, so this is for uh, two additional canine units uh, and the vehicles to, to house them. So that's a one-time uh, purchase for the initial training, the dogs and the vehicles that we would be using to transport them. Uh, and then for those of you that have ever come to the Chiefs Conference Room, uh, you, would, you would know that we have some limitations on our ability to 
to do web conferencing uh, and, and some other things. So we have a one-time uh, request for a conference uh, room communication upgrade. That's our yes. pastor. Quick question, how many canines do we have on the team? Right now we have two. So we uh, have four. Correct, correct. Uh, Councilmember Nelson. Hi, I'm just curious if you're giving us a presentation that was prepared by Chief Cox. So we prepared it in collaboration with Chief Cox. So it's a uh, collaboration of our leadership team. So we all give input to it and uh, he participated in the preparation of this, yes. Okay, thank you. Councilmember Ram Lowy. Back to the canines, does the University of Michigan have a canine team and do you collaborate with them when? Yes, yeah, absolutely. So currently uh, there are, they have two uh, explosive detection canines and they are two, they, I, I don't know if the Sheriff's Department has one now, but uh, so they are the only two dogs in this county. So if there's a, a, a bomb threat at schools or uh, at courts or anywhere else, they would be the resource that we would, we would call in. Um, and then the Kalia manager, now um, could in, isn't it, is it, would it be possible for the recently um, created position audit lieutenant help in this, you know, uh, area as well? I just feel like um, it, it, as we add full-time staff, reoccurring expenses. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So this is work that has to be done. Uh, and that we will do it. So if, if we're not approved for this position, it would be, uh, we would figure out who, who would best be suited to do it. Uh, so with the addition of that, it would be potentially a shared responsibility <coughs> with them. Thank you. Catherine Wong. Thanks. Thank you, Deputy Chief Forsberg. Uh, at the budget retreat, Chief Cox identified five FTE requests. Uh, Council approved one, the audit and review lieutenant uh, last month and and then three are listed as requ uh, requests for fiscal year 21, uh, data architect, public information officer, and the CALEA manager. Um, the fifth position that was identified at the, at the retreat was a strategic project manager, uh, but that's not being requested at this time. So can you speak to that? And also can I infer from, um, I, I like the smile, from these three positions being included uh, in your fiscal year 21 requests that uh, council will not be asked to um, approve a mid-year fiscal year 20 budget amendment. So the first question uh, of okay, why you're not first, seeing the first, first question, the project uh, manager strategic position. project manager. We saw that was that was presented at the budget retreat and it's not being requested this time. So can you just speak to that? That's true. I think we were trying to prioritize some of our, okay. our needs based Priorities on what we good. were seeing with your priorities. Okay. Uh, not to say you won't, we won't bring that forward again. Uh, but again, it's- But it's not being requested this time. Correct. For fiscal year 21. And then uh, my other question was, can I infer then uh, from these three positions that are, I see included in your fiscal year 21 request that council will not be asked to approve a mid-year fiscal year 20 budget amendment. I see the, the administrator. I, I think that's correct. Okay, it is correct? Yes. Okay, I can take it to the bank. Thank you very much. <laughs> and, and the reason, right. just, there, Thank you know, it, takes, it takes a while to recruit, so. Thank you. Um, but we're not going to do any more mid-year. That's budget. good. Okay. Thank you. Councilor Griswold, then move on to the next. On page 37 is a statement about develop an actionable plan to reduce crashes. And I'm somewhat troubled because the city has adopted Vision Zero. And so I thought that we as a city were working on reducing crashes. And, and we are. Um, the reason I, uh, we placed it here as well with public services is that we, as we've talked about the five E's, um, enforcement is one aspect, but some of the things that deal with engineering would be carried forward with public services. And we need to look at, at, at marrying those two things together. So some of it is collecting speed data, which would fall underneath public services. Some of it is enforcement and encouragement. Uh, the police department this year with back to school did a very nice job of 
uh, increased encouragement as well. So without getting into too much detail, I think we know where the, the worst positions are, worst areas are in the city. Some of that can be done through changing the infrastructure. Some can be done with better enforcement. But I think um, in terms of getting to database type decisions, we shouldn't. We should look and see where people, where the speeding occurs, and then try and keep track both from a baseline and then after the uh, encouragement, enforcement, and education kicks in. So that's why it's it's combined. Okay. And I'm assuming that we're already looking at where the crashes are occurring. We are. a bigger screen just in case I can't read this one like last time. Uh, good evening, Mayor and Council. Um, it's good to be here. Um, oh. There we go. Uh, who we are. I think everybody by now has seen this slide on uh, multiple occasions over the last couple of years. Uh, we are community services made up of parks and recreation, community development. Uh, community development is really a catch-all for both the work we do and in and, and partnership with the Ann Arbor Housing Commission and also uh, the Office of Community and Economic Development uh, through Washtenaw County, um, who Teresa Gelati is here as well, if there's any questions about uh, what services they provide for us. Building and rental services and planning. Um, I think most of you have seen these through your council homework. Uh, these are programs and activities that the uh, community services area does, or at least that was ranked or, or discussed through your budget priorities. I'm not going to go through everything individually. I know you're all dying, and I know that the court's super excited to get up here as well. Um, but I'll touch on some of the, the, the big ones we have coming up this year. Uh, in building and rental services, uh, the third one down, uh, improved customer service satisfaction ratings. Similar to parks and their installation of Rec 1 with the replacement of track at an intergov, we uh, are hoping, and we're not hoping, we know um, it has some integrated uh, uh, customer service satisfaction survey tools uh, that we don't currently have, so we're looking forward to implementing those uh, this year. Under planning, I think everybody's aware of the master plan, but I think the other th big thing that's going to come about and probably hear more about and I think it's going to be a result of the uh, carbon neutrality plan that comes out in March or the strategy is I imagine that the UDC, um, whether it's related to parking or sustainability aspects, is going to be looked at um, to see what improvements need to be made to meet those carbon neutrality goals coming forward. So um, on a future slide, you'll see uh, some money put in the budget this year. Um, probably our biggest addition um, from fiscal 20 um, to potentially discuss or, or take a, or evaluate the UDC for, for those issues. Um, parks and recreation, um, not a lot of change. It is the second year of a budget um, for us uh, and uh, it pretty much maintain our course. Uh, we are always, as, as far as parks and recreation, very interested in our users. Um, we have a very robust customer service satisfaction survey tool um, as part of that Rec 1. Uh, the department continues to, to, to meet exemplary goals of over 90% or mostly over 95% um, positive responses um, uh, for, from our users, past users, and, and people who use the park systems. Community development, um, I think it's no, no surprise the biggest issues deal with affordable housing. Um, council has already taken a, a significant amount of action towards uh, evaluating affordable housing programs, use of city property for affordable housing. Um, I'm not going to touch on it too much today. I think when Jennifer comes forward with the Housing Commission budget, you're going to see uh, the continuation uh, of those programs and, and the evaluation of property and, and how to meet our affordable housing goals um, from there. This is how we spend our money. Again, a similar slide I think you've seen from all the other departments. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. I'm hitting, I'm hitting it on my computer and forgetting to hit it on that. I apologize. I'm so worried about not being able to read the tiny screen up here. I'm moving mine and not the one up there. Does anyone want me to go back to the previous slide? Are we we're good? We're good? Okay. Yeah, it's similar to all the other slides you've seen. So I apologize for that. Um, how we spend our money by unit. Um, I, I don't think this is anything new. And then the uh, council priorities established uh, that we just I skipped over on the previous slides, adjusted by how we spend our money. Um, make sure I do this. Uh, measures of success based on council priorities. These are the performance measures. Some of them are, are kind of um, amalgamations of what we use or more individualized performance metrics in the budget. Um, but for the building area, we talk about timeliness of inspections, both of rental units, and that probably should read uh, building and trade inspections, 
for us, you know, doing, we do tens of thousands of inspections a year. Um, our customers, their priority is how fast we can get out on their site, um, whether it's residential or commercial building, um, get an inspection done and allow their projects to move forward. So that's always a priority for us. Um, again, we talked about improved customer service uh, satisfaction ra uh, ra uh, ratings. We're hoping to have a better understanding of that through that tool. Um, in turn, compliance with building codes goes to the basic uh, desire to make sure we have a safe and, and usable housing stock within the city. So, um, uh, community development, um, we've touched on affordable housing. Um, it says here in increased support to community county sheltering. Um, what that really is is last year for uh, to balance the budget last year until we knew what the revenues were this year. There was a $30,000 cut to the, the amount of funds we send over to the Office of Community and Economic Development uh, projected uh, for fiscal 21 in case we had revenue shortfalls. Um, we're hoping that's not the case and that we're proposing to restore that $30,000 um, to its previous year's uh, amount, which in total is about $165,000 a year we provide to uh, community and economic development through the county to staff our uh, HHSAB, to do our affordable housing uh, work, uh, urban county work, and also uh, coordinated funding. So that, all that uh, increase we'll do, and you'll see it in a minute, is put funding levels back to previous year's levels. Uh, parks and recreation, um, maintain customer service, planning, things we've talked about before, uh, performance measures, um, I think we've we've touched on these already. Uh, impacts to achieve council priorities. Um, building a rental. We have really no impacts. The only the only FTE we added was a split with the OSI Office of Sustainability and Innovation. We came to you early in fiscal 20 to do that, so that's already been approved by council. Um, as a recurring expense, so we have no no additional FTE asks above that, um, no real impact statements, um, other than a few adjustments to salary. That's actually a net benefit to the general fund this year. Um, community and economic development, you see in here, you see the restore the fiscal 21 level funding um, for the Office of Community and Economic Development. Um, that's where that's at right now. Parks and recreation. Um, we do have a few minor impact statements uh, you, you'll see in a minute, but nothing that had to do with the satisfaction ratings. That's why that's zero here. Um, as, w as I discussed earlier, under planning, um, address the parking and sustainability asset aspects of the UDC. We see when the carbon neutrality strategy comes out that the UDC is going to get a significant amount of attention over the next year or two. Um, and therefore, as a placeholder right now, we're proposing an additional $100,000 uh, for professional or potential professional services to assist with those changes to uh, the UDC. Um, it doesn't mean they're an absolute, but we're putting it in there now because we anticipate, as we've done over the last year or two, we've seen a significant amount of requests both from staff um, and council to make adjustments to existing UDC ordinances. So um, that's why that's in there. And then the money for the master plan um, it's already been proposed to council as a contract and, and budget appropriation, but we thought it was appropriate to call it out here even though it's something that's already being considered. And then lastly, um, other impacts, again for the same reason as the reduction to Office of Community and Economic Development. Last year there was a, a $50,000 cut um, proposed for fiscal 21 for the Deer Management Program. Um, oop, I forget to change again, I apologize. Um, so this is, this is the, the changes or the impact sheets or impacts that were not on the previous priorities. Um, the deer, deer management program as a, as a, until we knew what revenue was again in fiscal 21, there was a proposed cut of $50,000 put in last year's two year budget. We're asking that be restored to previous year's levels. It's not an increase over last year's, but it would be the same at 150,000. Um, we did do, and Parks and Recreation did do a salary study with HR on our temp and seasonal employees um, and determined that there is an adjustment needed um, for our temp and seasonal employees. That does have a $28,000 impact on the upcoming budget. Um, that's, and the, the HR study uh, justifies that based on other composition. It's, it's becoming tougher and tougher. Um, when we ramp up seasonal employees in Parks and Rec, we're talking 200 to 300 additional employees. 
So this money is, although it's 28,000, is, is, is relatively minor in comparison, and it goes to specific positions that are important to how we run our facilities. Similarly, the uh, first aid and CPR certification for reimbursements to lifeguards, that's something previously we didn't cover the cost of for our lifeguards. It's becoming increasingly difficult to attract quality lifeguards um, to our pools and, and, the, and, the, and the system. Um, so that is something we feel like is an appropriate cost for us to cover for potentially qualified lifeguards coming in who need that certification. So, so you're going to uh, reimburse the lifeguards, but you also require first aid and CPR for a lot of your like day camp mm -hmm. assistant positions. So those would not those people would not be reimbursed but they would be required to have that certification yeah right now we're only proposing the the lifeguard positions just because of the difficulty recruiting them Colin is here if, he, if I need any clarification but um, that's not something we're proposing right now or something we already cover so, um, we're actually proposing to cover the cost for the lifeguard staff and for the uh, first aid CPR for all the seasonal staff that we have. So we actually require all of our staff positions to have first aid CPR. It's just a key for us kind of across all of the facilities for safety. Thank you. Yep. Okay, thank you. Oh, thanks. I'll, I, I'm sure you can answer this also. Um, so just curious about that. So when you're, when you're doing that program, is it like a direct reimbursement to Red Cross or why don't we just hire them to run the classes or something? Um, so we actually do have staff that actually teach the classes, okay. but then there's still a cost uh, to turn in the paperwork to get the certification through the Red Cross. Oh, okay. But we actually have a number of our full-time staff actually teach the classes. I wonder if the public would be interested in that. Just uh, we also offer the lifeguard classes uh, through our own staff at times, and there are certainly a number of the public that actually mm -hmm. take advantage of that. So, former WSI guy here, I, <laughs> it's it's worth it for people to know how to how to swim. Councilor Master, I just had a quick question about: Did we bury in here um, possible inspection or? Uh, things with having to do with the short-term rentals. <laughs> <laughs> no. I didn't see it in there. Nope. And I thought maybe You're going to do it, it in-house, right? Somehow get yes. Cur cur currently the intention is, is any adjustment or any additional staff time necessary to do inspection of short-term rentals is going to be absorbed by existing staff. Um, we do, we have 30,000 rental units. The, the increase of the short-term rentals to that workload is, is rather insignificant from an inspection standpoint. Mm -hmm. The process of potentially enforcement, um, we need to do some more evaluation of. But same as rental units, like I said, the impact of short-term rentals compared to the enforcement we have to do on long-term rentals already is relatively, relatively mm -hmm. minor and we believe would most likely be covered by any uh, fees for those registrations. So we, we're not proposing any budget impact to that currently. Next year, fiscal 22, if we're wrong, we might be back yeah. talking about that, but we, we don't foresee a big increase in cost at this time. Yep, I've got Lum, Eaton, Hainer, and then perhaps we can call it a day because we won't. Okay, so quickly, so speaking of fees, I didn't see any uh, revenue items on the budget impact uh, sheets for parks and recs, so I don't know if those increases normally appear uh, on those pages or not, um, but in any case, are we planning any parks and rec fee increases for fiscal year 21? No, no. no. none. Okay. None in building and rental and none in, in parks either. You said, and not in building also? Mm -hmm. No fee, no fee just quickly, are, did you add some more slides for this? Because I, I downloaded the slides from Legistar and I don't know, like 47 is the 15th district court and it, it, I, didn't I downloaded it a few I'm days ago. 40s. Oh, okay. The, the yeah. added the pictures. I think it's the fire department picture. The fire department decided to show pre pictures. Oh, okay. So that's me up too. That's nice. what, okay. That was nice. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. So, um, because there's no mention of short-term rentals in this material, yeah. can we expect that um, we'll 
have accomplished that goal by the end of this fiscal year? We'll, we'll, have, a, we'll have a proposed ordinance in front of council before this fiscal year is up, okay. for sure. And then related to that, um, you, you note that you're going to adjust the seasonal and temporary um, wages. Will that bring them up to what our living wage ordinance requires of our contractors? No, it's, it's, not, it's not fully up to living wage, no. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Council Ruth. Hainer. So I have to ask Derek, so it was the deer call expenses were going down to 100 and now they're back up to 150. So does that mean that it is indeed not over and that we're going to continue the calling? That's, that's completely up to city council and I imagine we'll have that discussion moving forward. Right now we're putting a, the money in the budget in case council does decide to move forward with the program. So if, if we did, so we had a four year plan and then we had a five year plan and so would we rebid the contractor on that? Was this starting over again or is this some kind of maintenance? Or I'm just curious what made you think it was going to go up again instead of well, tapering and, into this and, maintenance and again, mode? Again, the, the cut was more based on um, a revenue exercise. When we do a two-year budget um, to bring in a balanced budget for fiscal year 21, um, oh, after doing the program again this year, with the expectations of what we did this year, just repeating that yes, this year, next year, if that is council's desire, um, we spent pretty close to that whole 150. So if the program is going to go forward and it's going to go forward consistent with the activities that took place last year, which um, was really what we feel is if we're going to do it successfully is the minimum amount of activities and data research that comes along with it, we would recommend a, a recurring cost of 150,000. Um, whether council wants to go forward with that, again, we certainly, we had a resolution for four years. We came for a one-year extension based on the research permit from the DNR. Um, some type of staff is going to want some type of action from council authorizing us to continue action. And two, uh, your question was to rebid the contract. We haven't revisited that. Um, to date, we haven't found another vendor similar to White Buffalo that provides this service to our satisfaction. Um, under normal circumstances, because of the value of the contract, this is something we would rebid, and we may put it out there again just to validate what our thoughts are. Um, but we haven't made that decision yet. Thank you. Well. Probably don't want me to speak to dear management, but just quickly, thank you for uh, incorporating this. Okay. And uh, in terms of full disclosure, I did indicate it as a priority on my homework. And uh, I would just en encourage my colleagues who haven't uh, uh, read Dr. Corto's uh, assays and reports uh, the data on the impacts um, and 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 how it correlates to deer management, I think, is is very you know it's significant and it's substantive. And when Dr. Uh, Professor Dr. Um, Christopher Dick came and spoke to us, and he indicated that um, in the absence of this program, uh, we would have something like you know, 6,000 more deer today. And the impacts on our natural, our natural areas are simply not sustainable. Um, and so my pitch, but thank you. It's, it, I, I appreciate seeing this here. Thank you very much. Thanks, sir. And last but not least. Good evening, Council and Mayor Taylor. Thank you. I'm here on behalf of the court. Uh, the purpose of the court is to provide a place where people can safely come and, uh, sorry, let me start over. <laughs> I'm a little bit nervous. The court provides the community with an impartial, safe, and accessible forum for the resolution of public and private disputes. Uh, our units are listed up there. Uh, we do have a number of specialty programs that we perform. Uh, sobriety court for second offense drunk drivers, uh, veterans treatment court for those who have served in the armed forces, mental health court, uh, dedicated domestic violence docket, street outreach court, or um, you could think of this as homeless court for people who are homeless or nearing homelessness. And we also have a case evaluation program. Um, with the exception of case evaluation, the programs are to help those who are in need of treatment. Um, 
and or other ancillary, ancillary services such as housing or education or job skills. Um, and you can see a breakdown up there uh, between the different departments. The only one up there that's a little bit new is court appointed attorney. Right now we are dealing with, and you'll see this on the horizon issues, uh, the Michigan Indigent Defense Commission is new to us. We're not quite sure how that's all gonna work out, although we do know that um, how that process is currently run will change in the near future. Uh, the first set of standards is out there, but um, part of the second set that they're looking to um, implement would take the court out of the equation, and so that is sort of a placeholder at this point. Uh, for measures of success, I'm sharing with you our public satisfaction survey results. In the results column, you'll see the agree or strongly agree numbers. Um, those are the 2019 uh, survey results. Uh, the only one there that you might raise an eyebrow to is question number five. The question or the outcome of the case was favorable to me. Uh, that would be, I would say, if that were higher, uh, that would imply that people were um, not responding who had not prevailed meaning we want people on both sides of that equation responding to our survey. Uh, as far as impacts, uh, we have had a significant increase in civil filings. Um, they're commonly known as provider cases or covenant cases. They are cases in which um, men uh, medical providers are suing auto insurance companies for payments of services um, on behalf of the insured. Uh, they usually center around auto accidents and treatment needed afterward. Uh, as you can see, the civil filing history uh, for new filings is there at the bottom. Uh, it's, over time, we've been able to cover the increases with existing staff and existing temp time that has been budgeted or by offsets such as leave of absences or vacancies. Uh, be, but that's becoming tougher and tougher as uh, the level of filings increase. Uh, so you see that personnel time is mainly what we're asking for funding for. And then in addition to that, there's a third impact, which is an increase in the hourly rate of the officers who do the weapon screening. Horizon issues, um, as mentioned, there is the Michigan Indigent Defense Standards that are um, the first four are in place, but more are coming. We know that. Uh, we have trial court funding is an issue. There was a committee set up that, uh, by the legislature that looked at how trial courts are funded and made recommendations for ways to change it. Uh, while they've made their five recommendations, there's not a set plan at this point as to how we're gonna get there. Uh, but part of what it looks at is how uh, there might be a more of a balance between the state and the local uh, level of funding and courts. And then the last one there is e-filing. Uh, the State Court Administrative Office is um, moving courts towards this. They are providing the system. They are providing a document management system that works with it. Uh, but uh, right now, um, we are in what they're, they're calling them waves as they're moving the courts on board with this. Uh, we are not scheduled to go into wave six. Right now, they're on one. So this is definitely in the future. All right. Any, any questions? Any questions? All right. Again, the trial court funding. So you said the state is looking at changing how, I don't know, the model or so the formula? They're looking at, um, they've, they've put together a committee of different stakeholders to look at how they're currently funded and then to look at other states where, um, there are different models so that they could make recommendations on how we might go forward and provide more stable, how they could provide more stable funding the for state. the courts. Uh -huh. It would still be a partnership between the state and the mm -hmm. local funding units. And when do you think that will be, will that, um, will the, any recommended changes uh, be, uh, I don't know, required to be affected this year or in fiscal year 21 or? I, I don't think so. They, mm. they need to start with legislative changes. Mm. Um, but long term, I think this is probably going to be a, at least a 10 year project. Oh, okay. In the other um, states that they were using as a, a 
best practices model for different reasons. Uh, one of them was 10 years and the other was 13 years as far as a timeline. So this is a horizon issue. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Absolutely, thank you. Thank you. So yeah, in summary, um, any FY21 budget questions you have, please send them to Ms. Higgins with copies to Mr. Crawford and me and Ms. Busselmeyer. Uh, as we've done in the past, those responses will be organized by topic and they'll be responded to throughout the budget season. We do have questions that stem from December. Those have not been lost or forgotten. We will start to respond to those as well now that we've established the baseline from where we're starting. Excellent. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank uh, you all very much. The presentation reflects quite a lot of work from uh, quite a lot of people. Uh, Thank you. And I would appreciate you know feedback on the presentation as well um, as we move more towards this idea of a uh, uh, priority-based budgeting and decision-making. Those things that are helpful to you to be engaged, please let me know those things that we didn't do that would be helpful. Let me know those as well and we'll continue to adapt and change the process to meet your needs um, as you look at the budget. Thank you. We now come to public comment general time. Public comment general time is an opportunity for members of the public to speak to council and the community about matters of municipal interest. To speak at public comment general time, one need not have signed up in advance. Speakers have three minutes in which to speak, so please pay close attention to the time clock. As a matter of courtesy, we may have only one person speaking at a time. And finally, if you require assistance in speaking before council today, we'd be delighted to provide it to you. Is there anyone who would like to speak at public comment? Please. Jim Mogensen. So I wasn't able to come to the work session. I came right at the end, very end of the work session that you had in December. Um, but this is, uh, uh, I'm going to uh, bring up a, a concern that I've had. Um, one of the uh, quips about Ann Arbor is it's fake left, run right. Um, in the whole presentation, it doesn't say what the total general fund budget is. It has all the percentages. And I kind of tried to do some, you know, quick back of the hand. I think it's $88 million. But that's the whole general fund budget. Maybe it's more than that. I don't know. Right? Uh, people may, some people who have seen me do the red ribbon chart to provide some perspective. So the total amount that um, was provided to the uh, human service providers was like $1.2 million. And when I did the red ribbon chart, I had one foot, right, for the $1 million. And then oh, the whole general fund is 80 feet long, right, because we get stuck in these PowerPoint presentations. And it constricts our ability to think about those perspectives, right, because when, when, when <coughs> you allocate the money in June, the Ann Arbor News reports it and says, city of Ann Arbor has doled out all this money to the human service agencies. And when you start to look at how much money that is, and you start to look at, at the breakdown, right, the city administrator's office has a million dollars, it's not as much as people think. And I'm bringing this up because I raise money in the religious community for affordable housing and other things. And it's not enough money. The coordinated funding model doesn't have enough money. And it's creating dysfunction in that system. And when that happens, right, the coordinated funded uh, model allowed, created a little bit more efficiency so you don't have to go to all the very different uh, public bodies to, to do that. But we still have development directors in all of our nonprofits and they're all sending us things and fundraiser uh, events and everything else, right, to try and make this all work. And the challenge of doing this is in the public sector, it's a whole lot easier to budget an extra $100,000 than it is to raise $100,000 at some kind of event. The community foundation, uh, the, the, the whole budget of coordinated funding is $4.3 million. And that includes the city and the county and the United Way and the federal CDBG money, right? And the community foundation and St. Joe's puts in $250,000. That's all that that's all that's there. And, we're, and it's, creating, it's creating dysfunction and it's, 
it's a crisis. It's not entirely city council's fault that there's not enough money. There's a structural reasons why there's not enough money in the city. But, um, um, you, you know, I think we need to get, get around that and start planning for the future because eventually it'll come back here when real crises has happened. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else who would like to speak at public comment? Ken Garber. I'm going to talk more about the carbon budget than the city budget. I'd argue they're equally important. Um, your package's first slide tonight showed student volunteers on the fire station six roof after the so solar panel installation last November. We put in 52 kilowatts of solar power. That saves about 56 metric tons of CO2 a year from escaping into the atmosphere and adding to global heating. I'll get back to those 56 tons in a minute. First about flying. Flying is the single worst thing you can do to the climate. There's a reason that Greta Thunberg and prominent climate scientists like Kevin Anderson and Peter Kalmus refused to fly. Uh, CO2 emissions from burning jet fuel are 0 0.3 kilogram per passenger mile for coach passengers, but it's really a lot worse than that. The non-CO2 effects include nitrogen oxides, which convert to ozone in the lower atmosphere. Now, ozone higher in the, in the stratosphere is good because it blocks the sun's harmful UV radiation. But in the troposphere, where jets fly, it's a powerful greenhouse gas. Jet, jet engines also produce condensation trails, known as contrails, and they seed cirrus cloud formation. High ice clouds like these allow incoming solar radiation but reflect outgoing thermal radiation, thus amplifying the greenhouse effect. Overall, burning jet fuel generates about 0.8 kilograms CO2 equivalents per passenger mile. So a single person flying round trip coach from Detroit to Germany is responsible for 6.73 metric tons CO2 equivalent. Um, that's more greenhouse gas than the average American emits in a full year of driving. And if nine people from Ann Arbor, say seven council members and two staffers, make that single Germany trip, that would completely wipe out a full year's greenhouse gas emission, or gas reduction from the fire station six solar installation. Remember, those were the 56 tons of CO2 equivalents we thought we'd prevented, but now you've put them back into the atmosphere. You can buy carbon offsets, but that's no solution. Offsets almost never take into account the non-CO2 heating effects of air travel. Um, there are other reasons why they don't work, uh, but uh, every flight is adding demand to the aviation industry and encouraging further investment uh, in expanded runways, terminals, air aircraft, investment that should be going into renewables. Offsets do not take this demand effect into account at all. When we fly, we are locking in an industry that is very high carbon. Uh, I'm not claiming moral superiority here. I've flown a lot during my life, despite knowing the harm I was inflicting on the planet. I only quit flying four years ago, so I speak out of a sense of shame and belated responsibility to our young people. I'm not asking you not to fly. I just thought you should know the facts. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else who would like to speak at public comment? Hello there. My name is Zoltan Jung. I live on Barton Drive. Our, we're being affected by the upcoming Barton Drive construction. We're very excited about that, the new roads, the new water mains, and so forth. We're one of the group of people, however, that don't have sidewalks yet. And so we're, we've got a large bill for sidewalk uh, installation. And what I'm trying to get a better feel for, for myself and for our neighbors is, is there some sort of mechanism by which like, there are subsidies or there are grants or something provided for the sidewalk installations? We, we're all in favor of public goods. I, former economist, I like the whole public good idea, but the flip side is that you know, we've got you know, people paying $17,000, in my case, $5,600 for a sidewalk. Um, it would be nice if we understood better how the city went about funding that sort of thing. We understand that the engineers make the best guesses. I'm an engineer too, I get that. But still, we'd like to get a better feel for um, what other mechanisms there might be or what we can do. And uh, like poor Matilda had an $18,000 bill. Now that was a mistake, but still, you know, it's a big chunk of change. So uh, anyways, I will seed my remaining minute and a half so we can go home and uh, have a good time. But uh, thank you very much, I appreciate it. Thank you. thank you. Is there anyone else who'd like to speak at public comment? 
Seeing no one, public comment is closed. Uh, we are adjourned.